tell us something, and he was like, this is off record, and he went on a huge rant, and it, <laughs> it couldn't see the light of day. That's awesome. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I'm getting fat. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, you know, I'm on, my, I'm on meds, and it's kind of getting a, a, a little bit, you know, I'm feeling bad lately. Because I've been feeling great for like over a year since oh, okay. I started them, and then um, I've been feeling a little bad. But they said um, the other day they messaged me. I think they're going to do another brain scan just to kind of check in, see what's, uh, you know. Yeah. But I'm, you know, I'm fine. I so, really am fine. And there's your shot up there, Ed. I don't have any volume here. Oh, my. Hello, hello. Mine's not work. Mine's all staticky. It's not good. Hey, my mug kind of matches my shirt. That's, I didn't it notice does. that. Look at that. <laughs> That's awesome. Ed, I appreciate you coming over, man. I know you got a kind of a long drive from uh, here we are in Georgia. And by the way, these Georgia pines are driving everyone's allergies absolutely nuts. They got me. Yeah, Johnny was filming me yesterday. He was like sneezing all over the place. His eyes were all puffy and everything. So thanks for sitting down with us. I know uh, we're kind of in the loser circle this week here. When this airs, we're going to be well over it, but this morning it kind of sucks because we it, both had crappy tournament. That here very this week. bad. You know, I mean, I've fished uh, so far five days uh, in the Elite mm-hmm. Series this, this year. year. Had one bad day. Yeah. So, you it's know, not bad, I dude. mean, you know, that's that that's acceptable. If you can do four way to or look five at good the, days. Yeah, way to look at the statistics. You yeah, <laughs> I mean, I, I have to because, other, I mean, this is going to be running through my mind the entire drive back. Yeah. I mean, it's just, you know, you, you don't want to. Uh, I feel like I wasted a real opportunity when I did well at Okeechobee mm-hmm. and now I blow up here and right in the middle of the pack just missed the cut the top 10 cut at Okeechobee last week. yeah barely yeah. so I want to do the ed introduction okay because I'm a geek okay. so, so I, officially I'm, go ahead I'm geeking out about this so ed here's the cool thing about ed ed is on the elites he's fished from being a, a charter captain or a, a, a guide yeah I started guiding in high school so his whole life he knows this industry very well but what really makes Ed, like, brings it all together is he's also a lawyer. So he has seen things in this industry and understands both sides that nobody else has. I've, I've had a lot of things brought to me over the years. Right. So You're, prior to fishing the elites, even in the opens, and even before that. Yeah. Um, so I've... I've know where a lot of skeletons are not just the industry and not just law but man, you just have a lot of wisdom like in general yeah. like life in general i'm proud to call you my friend when i first you know met you through john cruz you know we room at john for a while and he said you're gonna like ed ed is he's either black or he's white there's no gray area with ed he's gonna tell you like it is or he's not gonna tell you at all and i'm actually proud to you're like you're literally you, I probably talk to you most throughout practice, whether it's text message or whether it's a phone call, um, which is crazy. You're a lawyer, and lawyers are supposed to lie, but I trust you <laughs> more than anyone in the field. I really do, and uh, I, I think I talk to you more than, than anyone, really. I kind of talk to Scott Martin, but, I mean, as far as, like, working together, patterns and things like that, you're, like, the only guy I really talk to regularly. Well, if – if I tell you something, it's going to be pretty accurate. Yeah. So, I mean, and I, I share information with you, and I really miss that you all are not traveling with us anymore. I mean, you know, with the uh, the entire Thanks to the animal bat. circus that you yeah. have. But <laughs> it, it's nice having dogs around. Yeah. And, and Johnny. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, uh, I like having our sheets. Yes. Yeah. It's, That's uh, true. It's nice. Just it's a level to, of comfort. Yes. Even if I haven't washed them in a little bit, I at least know right. what, exactly. what's been in them. So, um I want to just get into it because I know you have a 12-hour drive home whenever, and I, I feel like this one could go a long time just because you know so much in as the long industry. As it goes, I'm fine with it. Awesome. Um, so I want to just start out the gate. Um, it's been a huge topic with other anglers that we've talked to recently, Swindle mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and several, and that's that's the way the Bassmasters roles and all organizations' roles are written. And it just um, leaves a lot of options. We saw um, in an open this year, someone was able to winch into something. So we got a new a new role there. And then I was talking to Swindle and Swindle's like, and even the way it's written now, it, it, it leaves some leeway. So um, how does that work? Because I've always wondered, you hear about some anglers felling polygraphs, but then all of a sudden they're here hanging out and nothing happens. How does all that work? And before you answer that, I, in my mind, and probably in a lot of viewers' minds too, is like, 
Bass has a team of lawyers, this giant law firm, writing all these rules and, and writing the rule book for, for Bassmaster Elite Series competition, for Opens competition. That's not the case. Let me get close to the mic. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that is not the case. And yeah. actually, when I, when I came to the Elites, I offered to help them out with some of the rules mm. and uh, took a lot of time doing that. And virtually nothing was uh, altered that I had submitted. Well, what, to what's, what sort of things did you submit? Can you talk about that? I don't specifically remember. I mean, it's been now five years. Right. But I remember taking a good bit of time and, you know, li little tweaks here and there. Right. Really, there were redundancies uh, throughout the rules, which are pretty, yeah, I mean, it's a pretty hefty mm -hmm. little rule book. Right. Um, there were inconsistencies uh, that just didn't make sense. And so I went through and tried to. Tried to help them out. When they're since you know, like you know the the comp, you know the sport of competitive bass fishing. Right, yeah. Like you, you would know more than anyone. Yeah, and it, it's a lot of lawyers. They they don't fish. They don't fish tournaments. Mm -hmm. There are a few hanging around that do. Sure. Um, but uh, but so I, I I like trying to. I, I wanted to try to help, and, sure. and a few of the changes were were undertaken, but some of them weren't. But uh, but as far as your question, trait. Um, the rules are the rules, and if they are written in a certain way, that's the way they are. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know the exact uh, situation that happened in an open last fall where I think Keith Poche winched his boat into a location right. um, or moved his boat, and it, by all accounts, it was not against the rules. Right, and exactly. so that's that. Yeah. Um, just that's give that. me the rules, enforce them evenly. Right. Enforce them logically, enforce them the way that they were intended. Yeah, and you're fine. But you know, with with, with us crazy bass fishermen, mm -hmm. I mean, there are things that happen right. all the time mm -hmm. um, that you never see before, and you're never going to see again. Right. Um, one happened the first day of this tournament when Larry Nixon had a fish get out of his uh, bag into In one of the tanks. Oh wow! And then it jumped out and landed near chris johnson larry is removed he's up at the bump tank and this happened back at like the first tank oh wow and larry had noticed he didn't have a fish and oh. that had, ward had not made it back and didn't chris johnson or Corey johnson have six fish in their bag at this time chris put that fish in his bag because oh, it jumped out of the tank man. he thought he thought he was standing there and it appeared as if it came out of his i guess oh. and so he put it in there fortunately and i think this was the right decision myself uh -huh. based on logic and fairness um, when it was determined that that's what happened, Chris came up. I was standing right there. Uh -huh. I mean, Larry Nixon was in, immediately in front of me when all this happened. And Chris put his uh, fish, dumped him into the bump tank, and there were six fish there. Mm -hmm. One of them, and Larry had been saying all along, it's a tiny fish. Okay. They're all, all minor tiny right, fish, right, like right. little 12 inch. Uh -huh. And Chris had a reasonable bag. He had, 17 you know, or he, something that day. I think, yeah, he had something like that. And so it was... Kind easily of identifiable right that's it and larry even said that's the one but what happens if <laughs> what what happens if it's three and a half yeah that's a different ball game or so whoa that's a very unusual situation but mm -hmm. um difficult facts make bad law right. that's something that people people say and those are very difficult facts that none of us are probably ever going to see again mm -hmm. hopefully so but what are you going to do jam chris for having six fish in his bag right unintentionally I mean, that's, yeah, yeah that's, i mean it 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 it, it was uh, i wasn't concerned with it and i was literally right there wow. when Weird. so when um like these organizations like the two major ones major league mm -hmm. and, and bass when they have situations like that because they're i assume they own the company and they wrote the rules do they in the end even if they have a rule written a certain way does it matter? Like, can they do what they want? Yes. Um, I mean, yes is the short answer. You know, these are privately operated companies. Um, wouldn't really matter that much if they were publicly operated, but they're privately operated. They can do what they wish. I mean, this is something that we are doing voluntarily. We're participating in it. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, to prevent a, uh, a revolt or a mass exodus, let's say, mm -hmm. um, you know, you should try to enforce things fairly, logically, reasonably. And, you know, with with situations, as we were talking a little bit before, with BASS, um, if you get protested, let's say, uh, you know, like Keith Poche at that, at that open, 
I think he got protested. I have no idea. But um, if he did, let's say BASS found that he had violated a rule and he didn't think that was right. He could appeal it. Mm -hmm. That right to appeal is in BASS rules the last time that I looked at them. And however, if let's say there was a different situation where someone was dead to rights, like fishing in this boat basin over here at Seminole. Off limits. To the total off limits. Off -limits yep. No question. He's videoed in there. Some Someone, you know, I'm in there fishing and, and someone protests me. Uh -huh. Well, I'm wrong, 100% wrong, caught dead to rights. You protest me. Ten other people protest me, and BASS just says, nah, it, it, it's fine uh, because, no appeal. you know, we, we, we just we don't care why. It's just it's fine. He can fish there. Even though I'm caught dead to rights, there is no method or mechanism that you can appeal that. Wow. So the person who is the one who gets a violation or gets uh, thrown out or DQ'd because of a protest, he can, in fact, appeal it to a panel Extent. of anglers oh. i believe it goes to a panel of anglers wow. I think. Um, like a jury yeah i mean uh, i think a panel of anglers and, and also like a representative from bass i'd have to review the rules again so, so how is that possible so like for a, a major league fishing or a bass is that isn't there a line that says uh it is at bass's di ultimately it's at bass's discretion or however it's worded it's yeah, and, yeah. and that just goes back to what you know trait was saying that i mean these are private companies and they can do what they want but you still have to to retain your credibility yeah integrity and integrity you still have to have some level of fairness and mm -hmm. sense to it all otherwise right. it's just you know we're, it's just the wild west and you can't have that in something when <laughs> people are making their living off of this have you seen some situations where you're like uh Maybe that wasn't very fair. And your career goes deep too. I mean, you compete. You competed back in the '90s. I mean, was it like the Wild West back then? Um, back then, less Dewey, structured. Dewey Kendrick, I believe, was still the tournament director in the early '90s when I was fishing a few invitationals. No um, live covers. No YouTube, Instagram. No. It's just all. Dude, it was 150 horsepower limit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was nothing. I mean, it, it was you know, it, it was a different world. Yeah. I mean, you know, we all had flashers and 18 foot oh lines. yeah dude. i mean so it was a different world so um you know the tournament director has a lot of say um frankly i think it has gotten better um i think it's gotten a lot more better as the sport has mm -hmm. evolved and as people are making a living doing this and the coverage is out there um i think things have gotten a lot better um okay. from the old days yeah so good speaking of better um t how old how old is your son tommy now he is he's almost 17 17 so okay yeah, so, so he's, he's getting that age if if he were to gain interest in the sport of bass fishing, i don't know if he does or not if he says dad i think i'm gonna give this professional bass fishing a try what do you say absolutely not yep Golly, that's <laughs> you're the second everybody guy. yeah third much. i think third person well but let, let i asked heron i asked uh uh clon they both said nope <laughs> well so I tried to make a living doing this. Mm -hmm. um, so I started off fishing. Actually, next month, it'll be 40 years ago, I fished my first tournament. Ooh. So I was 12 years old on the Upper Potomac River for smallmouth. And I was See what I say about wisdom? Club. This guy's full of wisdom. So I'm full yeah, of something. Yeah. I'm an attorney. <laughs> um, but so, so I fished all the way through um, high school. There was no high school bass fishing. There was no such thing at the time. Um, but I started fishing red man tournaments which is now you know mlf uh, or bfls i should BFL, say BFL, right um so i started fishing those and started guiding my senior year in high school started getting some notoriety around was the this DC up area dc yeah, yep, yeah i mean yep. i'm from dc i was yep. born in washington dc yeah um so gained some notor notoriety and then started guiding more and more my college choice was based off of my guide business wow i went to school in northern virginia wow so i could still guide um and so I progressed all the way up, fished the All-American, the Red Man All-American, BFL All-American when I was 21, was the youngest guy to ever qualify by that point. Mm -hmm. And I was on that path. And then I fished the Invitationals, and I barely missed making what back then I think was the BP Top 100s. Uh, or top one, the, the cream of the crop, right? Yeah. yeah. And so I missed that. And it was, uh, I, I kind of, pushed all my chips in the table mm -hmm. and it really ended up uh not bittering me but i mean I, I was worn out at 25 
And so I stopped, basically stopped tournament fishing. Wow. Um, and went a different path. And I am so thankful that I did because I have seen the sport. Yeah. Now, look, there are a lot of guys and people that are friends of mine, the Mark Daniels of the world. Yeah. Um, Good dude. Brandon Palinick, mm -hmm. um, you know, people that their talent's undeniable, but they sort of went all in, pushed their chips in. At an early you, you age. did kind of the Similar, same thing. Similar, sure, sure. Um, and made it work. And I just think that unless you are a talent like some of the people I've just mentioned, which there are very few out there. Very few. It is a grind of an existence, and I've seen it uh, churn up and destroy businesses, marriages, marriages health, bank finances, yep. everything. Yep. And that's why I am very happy that I was able to go and have uh, a different life going through a Wall Street trading firm and then on to be a lawyer. Yep. Um, and coming back to it after about a 15 year hiatus. So awesome. And having um, a little bit, being able to fish a little more free. Comfort. You got yeah. comfort behind you, yeah. you know? And you have yeah. wisdom. Too. Wisdom, comfort. Uh, you all family, keep mentioning support. that. I yeah. don't know. Yeah. We'll, well, well, I mean, we'll I mean more of just like real world experience yeah. of, yeah. of yeah. how right. things could work and can work. So yeah. you look at and things different. That That's probably true. Yeah. So. But, uh, wow. but and yeah, you've so known John Cruz that, well, since, uh, did you guys draw each other to begin with or no? No. So we have a mutual friend, Rick Hawkins. Hawkins. That's right. So, and, uh, it, I was introduced to John by him and John was probably little guy. He was probably 14, <laughs> something like that. 15. We went out and fished on Smith mountain Lake at the time I was just visiting. I, I had, I'm going to stop you for a second. So every time you turn your head. I'm sorry. No, you're fine. Just no, fine. no, the comment section got me on another one. And they're like, maybe you should, you know, tell your guests that. So okay. um, just, you know, comment section. They look like they grill us. This? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. That's all right. Rick Hawkins, uh, 14. 14 years old. Yeah. So um, and John at the time, Rick had just come back from California, was living on Smith Mountain Lake. And I, I was still sort of half-assed guiding mm -hmm. um, after I had kind of blown out out of, out of the uh, sort of out of the industry or hopes of a, attaining being a professional tournament angler, and so John had the only boat out of the two of us. Uh, that was my recollection. <laughs> he had a little white nitro. Nice. Um, and so. We went out, and I mean, I, I kept in touch with him over the years. Was he a stick back then? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. I mean, so, you know. uh, but uh, but it's he is uh, he is a student of everything, and yes. so yep. like so many, Another he smart man, learns yeah. over time, mm -hmm. and he's become very proficient. Yeah. But uh, and so later, then when he started doing more, um, I believe the invitationals and some FLW stuff, I actually. I ended up uh, helping him get a boat, sold him a boat, and, um, you know, off to the races he went. Very so. cool. So yeah. at what point in your career or in life, like year-wise, was the first time you something ended up on your desk in the law form of, like, an angler needing help or a situation occurring? Like, when, when was your first uh, foray into fishing issues? Probably 2006, 2007 something like that yeah and that was an interesting issue it was Start an angler. The elite series okay. yeah it was probably it was probably 2007 okay that's my guess somewhere around there um and it was an interesting issue um an angler who had an agreement with a lure company mm -hmm. um they no longer after the year had gone had passed they no longer had a relationship with them and that entity had put into the Bass Pro Shops magazine or catalog a purporting or seeming to show that they still had a relationship with that uh, angler. They had his little picture uh, in the in the Bass Pro Shops magazine under the lure, and he was with a different company. Uh -huh. And so um, we filed suit and. With that, I filed a bunch of discovery asking for all kinds of numbers and financials to try to determine what the damages were ultimately going to be. Sure. And we ended up uh, 
you know, settling the matter for more than that angler would have gotten paid for that wow. year. Um, when because this angler- they, they had made they had made a mistake. They yep. had not gone through and diligently tried to get his name Removed. out of right, you know, magazines, and so it was an authorized it was an unauthorized use, use. of his image for commercial purposes. Wow, how about that? Do you see so. that a lot now? I know that in all of his contracts, that's something we have to negotiate because some of them will have like like forever we can use this likeness never let that happen yeah never some never. have a couple of years and we try and get it down to that's us. unreasonable yeah especially if it's a company that we're doing product with you know mm-hmm. um we try and give them just a little bit uh, yeah and, that, and that's reasonable as long as they're making a diligent effort and can back it up and show hey we sent Bass Pro Shops this letter and yeah. uh, and, and show that they took steps but have that's you, not the case have you seen that issue again uh, never since then hmm. never um, and, and I doubt I ever will. I mean, these things are, are one-offs. Um, but what you do see a lot is problems revolving around the renewal of contracts. Um, there was one situation where a, an angler, a professional angler, he had a deal with a huge brand, international brand, and it was a significant deal. It was a title deal. Mm-hmm. And... They had um, jerked him around starting in, you know, July, August of, of the year under which he was still he was still under contract, and his contract expired. My recollection on this one was like the end of October or something. Hmm. Kind of a weird, yeah, weird timing, sure. but that's the way the contract was written. Um, but the contract said if there's no notification either way, then it just renews for a year, automatic renewal. And... That's I would never let a client, if I represented the ma- the company there, ever allow that. that no, I mean no. I, that that that's ridiculous. You 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 can't do that um, because what I'm about to tell you is what will happen to you. So, the individual responsible for managing the pro staff and contracts and all of that, they did not give him notice by August or by October 31st or whenever it was required that there would not be a contract the next year. And so this guy's not looking for a new deal. He's sure. he's, he's a professional he assumes, angler. He, he assumes, assumes it renews. Wait, he doesn't assume it's written right there. Right there. Yeah, right, it says right, it's right, going right, right, right. It says it. Right. So um, without notification, it's yeah. Renewing. But he he didn't know that. So uh, eventually, I think in December, the person who was his uh, contact at that company said, "No, nah, we don't have a deal. <laughs> You're gone." And he got mad, and so he. In a roundabout way, as they all do, he found me, <laughs> and and so uh, you know a all that was needed was a letter to their huge corporate attorney, probably a thousand dollar an hour attorney, um, and he he got he got paid wow for the next year, and there was a big you know twenty page release and wow. settlement and everything, but it's it's something that those renewal terms often are a problem. So that's something to, that people should look out was for. Was that a, a seasoned angler or was it kind of a, uh, yeah, yeah mm-hmm. wow. Yeah. Because, I, I mean, I'm guilty of it. My first three or four years on tour, I mean, I, gosh, I did not read my contracts whatsoever. He didn't and then I met a, her, you know, yeah. He, he had no one looking at his no. stuff. Oh, my gosh. Even, no. even a situation with another one more recent, he likes to just sign things and get them done and then i'm like what are you doing i know ed you'd punch me right in the face if you saw some right. of the stuff right? but and now, probably. now with her and everything's growing you know we have a, a very good friend of ours from mississippi who's who's he, you know he's like he's an attorney he's mm-hmm. he still practices law and he's an avid fisherman that like you said there's very few of them around not a lot. yeah not a lot but uh, he looks over my stuff and that's good and i've bounced him a few things uh, uh, uh you know past you as well but um, you have a, a, a collection of guys that, you know, that every single year, uh, you know, would rely on you to just kind of, hey, look over this, look over that. Usually, How- yeah, yeah, usually with new sponsors. Sure. I mean, people will send stuff to me. Why do you think so many anglers don't have lawyers? Is it a money thing or? A- people don't like lawyers, one. Yeah. Um, especially. <laughs> I love lawyers. The, yeah. the general demographic that fishes. They don't like lawyers. Yeah. yeah. Um, but <laughs> yeah. but but unfortunately, you know, it's something that when you're getting into a business relationship with somebody, right? That you need to know where you stand, yeah. and you need to know the operative points in that agreement mm-hmm. that can hang you up. And I mean, I, I tell people 
all the time, I wouldn't do this, this, and this in, in this agreement. Um, and I don't like it for that reason. And these mm-hmm. are the consequences of it. But ultimately, they ultimately, do what I they mean, want. yeah, I mean, you, you, you sign it, just, you know, understand that these are the issues that I see. Right. Um, and, and a lot of people, you know, fishermen are unfortunately, um, a lot of fishermen are just happy to get a, a sponsor, a paying sponsor. Sure, you know, yeah. Whether it's you, five grand or they don't 20 pay grand a year. Yeah. You, you see people going around ICAST, you know, yeah. trying to start bidding wars just yeah. to go from 250 a month to 500 a month yep. with small sponsors yep. or something, you know, or $1,000 up to yep. 2,500 a month or something for bigger sponsors. Um, and it, it's it's the unfortunate reality. This is unbel- This is an unbelievably expensive sport yeah unbelievably expensive like bothersomely expensive yeah. horrible yep right outside that door that 50 of them launched this morning yep. half of them well not half a good majority of them are in the yeah in i that, mean and, and so there, there's always in the fishing industry it seems there's always somebody that if you're not going to do something in a take it or leave it contract situation um someone else will do it now i i will say that um I don't know that I would want to get into a business relationship with a company that said, here it is, my way or the highway. Yep, Mm -hmm. we've seen Um, that. Just because of the general tenor that that relationship's probably going to have. It probably isn't going to be great. Sounds like an MLF contract I I (laughs) read not too long ago or a couple of few years back. Yeah, it's, 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 uh, you just probably don't want to get involved in something like that, but that's people what are forced into it. Yeah, sure. that's what I've always... Forced. Al- I mean, this is all voluntary. Right. But, I mean, people, in order to compete, I mean, you have to pay five grand for a tournament yep. entry in these tournaments. Right. And the expenses. expenses, you're into it for 80 grand. Mm-hmm. And where are you going to get 80 grand? And people, need, people yep. need to get that's it. That's what so. I've always told him, uh, going back to the MLF reference and stuff. But I always told him what I had learned because my parents... Um, had been through some major issues uh, in my lifetime that I saw, and they involved contracts and, and, and people who really used them, and they were naive about things. And I told him, don't, whatever these people say to you, to your face, the, the BS they sling at you, wait till that contract. Because don't that matter. contract, when you read that contract, that's their real intentions. That's really how they operate, and it will show you things like i don't i remember that that mlf i'll say it i don't care if they come after me they were having they, they, <laughs> they were, gotta go through ed to get to you yeah. no. <laughs> <laughs> they um they were having those meetings uh to pitch these guys mm-hmm. and and i had already heard the red like listening to them i was just picking up red flags because of the experiences i had with my parents and i told chris he's like are you coming to the meeting and i was like absolutely not i just want to know what the contract says mm-hmm. i don't care do the that. sales yeah. pitch that they give me i don't give two what i can't say it on here i don't i don't care i just want to know how they really feel mm-hmm. yeah the one thing i'll say about that is that um with some of my sponsors i've gotten contracts from them mm-hmm. and they tell me one thing and then it shows up as another mm-hmm. i attribute most of that not to some nefarious plan or something yeah to get, legal it, it's it's the, legal the damn people. attorneys doing yeah sure it, it's and not normally or, they'll work with you though that's absolutely. what i've learned oh, okay yeah. so we send it to our lawyer he does his changes no problem you mm-hmm. know that's fair Understood. you're just right. making it right. fair Correct. it's when they say yeah no yeah and that and then that's you, a problem yeah and i i would attribute a lot of that like i said to the attorneys drafting the contracts or Mm -hmm. from wherever they get the contracts um because some of the contracts i've seen are just awful awful i mean just written poorly yeah oh terrible copy and pasted from it's because it's some marketing manager did Uh it Uh uh-huh yeah Uh, oh yeah not a lawyer marketing Uh, manager i mean they got it from somewhere so one one other buddy well some buddy in the industry or something that hey let me give that one and i'll change it around and you you find inconsistencies the old name of the company will (laughs) still be in there or the the old angler (laughs) yes I, i haven't seen that but yeah but the I mean, only thing I have. have you have yeah. it seems like the only thing they care about is the deliverables right three social media posts a month or this and that and the other and by the way that's probably the the most breached uh thing 
in a contract is like th- that type of deliverable. The the three social the three social media posts a month. Like I'm I'm guilty of it. Like can a company that sponsors me say you didn't make three three posts uh, social media posts that month? You don't get your monthly check or whatever. Technically, they could, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it really, but I I think that I think that it's smart to be able to. I think it's reasonable to to be able to adjust those things sure. on the fly. Right, I right, mean, right. It, it just depends because right. if they ask you to do something that's beyond the contract, probably very often you do it. Right. I mean, you know, so you go beyond, right. maybe you don't get three, maybe you get two or right. one this month sure, or that sure. month. But, uh, you know, it. the problem is that the contract, when, when the crap hits the fan, that's what people are going to rely on. Um, yeah. And very and rarely, right. frankly, does anything hit the fan. In, the, I mean, in this industry, right. Very so rarely. Small, I mean, yeah. I, mean I, I, I know that I, I mean, I filed... Just two or three cases. Yeah. Um, Would you say that's though more because the angler just doesn't they want back us? Off. They don't want to stir the pot and be blackballed, right? Th- there was a huge name in the industry that came to me, mm-hmm. and he was owed six figures Oof. by a company. Oof. And it's it 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 is a giant company in the industry, and I told him, you know, well, this is what likely you can do, and this he just. Said no, nah, I, I no can't. I, I can't do it. He could have collected, for in your opinion, you as long as that. it's collectible, right? Yeah. If it's there, I right. mean, yeah, if it's there, that's another problem. I mean, you know, getting getting money out of small lure companies is difficult. Fighting a big manufacturer is difficult. Wow. Um, so I mean, it's, but that's just the way. Yeah, it's the way it is. I mean, litigation sucks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it sucks. What? And you learned, so you learned obviously, and stepping back for a second, you you know, you, you did the the guiding thing that you tried your hand at the professional fishing thing at mm-hmm. twenty five, and then you said, you know what, let's try something else, and you went through law school, and uh, in you, between then, um, in late, I, I believe late nineteen ninety eight, early ninety nine, um, I got a job through a friend from high school mm-hmm. at a big Wall Street. A trading firm. Wow. Um, and they gave me the opportunity to either go to Jersey City, New Jersey, where their operation, their head operations were, or to the satellite office in Miami. Yeah. So I went to Miami. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, and I did that through 2001. So I was there as a working at a trading firm as a market maker for NASDAQ stocks, the second wow. biggest uh, NASDAQ, NASDAQ stock market maker at the time. And so did that, and when that company got purchased by Merrill Lynch for a billion dollars, um, they closed down the Florida office, and several of my friends had already left, and they were day trading. And so I went and day traded for about a year until the NASD and the SEC changed the rules of how things traded. So you couldn't um, make as much money. <laughs> <Yeah>. Correct. <laughs> it went from stocks used to trade in quarters, eighths, uh-huh. and, um, halves, depending on the price of the stock, and that allowed for very chunky trading. Things would move in big, big steps. Big, yeah. yeah. Whereas they changed in, I believe, early 2001 or mid 2001 to decimalization. Uh huh. So it went down to the nickels, are tighter. and yeah. it went down to pennies. And so instead of only four price points uh, within one point, you would have a hundred. Yeah. yeah. And so it slowed and calmed things down. But that mm-hmm. was in reaction to the around 2000 meltdown of of the nasdaq wow. because you would see stocks swing 50 points in a day right 100 points in a day um so i trade i day traded until the sec and nasd changed how things were done but during that time it, it was it Good. was awesome john came down and visited yeah. me and yeah. watched and it was it was it was wild e-trade took us to the super bowl and because me and 10 of my friends were killing it crushing it those we, quarters, you like those quarters, you said, yeah. Halves. You have you have yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> big, big box stuff. So. Yeah. But anyway, so I did that. And then at the uh, when, when that happened, I literally made a choice between I had to do something. And my wife's job had, had subsided. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the project, project she was working on had finished. And so I literally had, I decided I was going to make a choice between being a mobile marine mechanic 
(laughs) (laughs) or a lawyer. (laughs) And so I said, you know, I'll just go to law school. I like arguing. And and I I vividly remember in Florida, I got so mad at whoever our cable company was. And they were just screwing us over. (laughs) I, I was mad about it. And I, I just said, I'm going to go be a lawyer so I can hammer people if I Are need to. Are you serious? How about that? Yeah. And so I remember sitting. Cable, the cable company screwing yeah, you was the motivation. Phone company, yeah. cable oh, company. Sure, but of course. So, yeah. Somebody. And I was so mad about it, what it was. Yeah. And, um, and so I, I decided to do that. And I went and just took the LSAT and applied to a bunch of different schools. And off I went. Wow. And so, how many years later, I mean, were you? Uh, was I back to fishing? Yes. So... I guess that I quit fishing in 1998 when we moved to Florida. And I think that I really got back into fishing Federation stuff, I think, in 2011. Wow. So that's 13 years about. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe it was 2010. And the first year I came back, I qualified for the TBF on the um, FLW, FLW yep. side. Yep. The TBF Federation, I qualified for the national championship at Watts Bar and uh made the last day i'm all psyched you know i'm uh, i'm out there and throwing my flat side and everything nice. doing well i ended up fourth in the tournament I see this damn guy in the back of the pocket he's slinging a freaking tennis shoe looking thing and, and i'm like what the, what the hell is this person doing back there and so i work around i'm just casting my flat side and i go in in the middle and this kid's flinging this Splash. giant and uh, i don't even know what it is it's palinic <laughs> nice. So he fi- he fished that he fished that tournament and uh, he ended w- up Watts seventh Bar? at Watts, Watts Bar. Bar. I think it was 2011, and uh, you know it. But yeah, that, that's the first time he I was saw a him. little guy back there. Yeah, and, and both of us made the All American because if you were the highest finisher from your division in that tournament, you made the All American. And so uh, so we uh, we sat together out at the All American at DeGray Lake in Arkansas. Yeah, a place that I hope Sucks. they have drained. Yes, um, pulled the plug on that thing. But yeah. I remember Brandon did well. Wow. And I remember I finished comparable to this tournament at Seminole, somewhere right around last. Wow. So, but yeah, so it I, I took about thirteen years off. That's a hard route to take too. That that route you just said. And he he qualified a very hard way. You ended up qualifying through the opens. I did. Yeah. 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 I I fished the opens starting in. Like I said, I think maybe 2012, 12, maybe 13. 13. Some, yeah. And I would fish the Northerns and the Southerns, or one year it might have been called the Easterns, and there were four tournaments instead of three. Um, and I did well. Um, you know, I mean, I would cash checks, and I think I finished in the top 10 two or three times, missing qualifying by a little here, a little there. But ultimately, uh, you know, I, uh, I ended up making it and been here now five so you were years. such a calm like you've got so much going you still practice law you still monday morning probably you're probably going to be in a courtroom somewhere uh i don't know if i'll be in a courtroom but i'll be in the office in the Tuesday, office I'll be in a courtroom it's how do you go from and i and I, staying at your house i mean i saw you like <laughs> literally like one day you're one day you're bass fishing literally the next day you're you're in a suit and tie in a courtroom and yep. then that afternoon you're in, you know, rental properties. Yeah, rental properties, I mean, and then yeah. that afternoon you're mowing your lawn, and you know, and and uh, like how do, you, I, like you do, you do such a good job at shutting your mind off on on this thing, and then focusing on that, being successful with that, and then being successful with this, that, and the other. Like, that's that's insane. You know, um, it's a fishing related story that I actually learned a lot about focus um and just dealing with the task at hand at hand and it it happened a very long time ago i I was probably maybe nine years old and my grandparents had taken me to uh like north miami beach or something um and we went out on a party boat Mm -hmm. you know just a a headboat i I I mean literally this was like 1979 you're just along for the ride yeah i mean and, and so we go out there unbelievably rough go out a haul over inlet which is an awful inlet Anyone can go online and look at the oh yeah that happens yeah they pop all up all inlet. the time yeah it's awful yeah it's the people worst. get drunk and send it to the inlet it's they... it's the worst inlet yeah. on the east coast I think yeah um, and so we went out of there unbelievably rough boats pitching around like horribly probably shouldn't have even gone out the boat was called the Popeye two I'll remember <laughs> it till the day I die and uh, we go out there and there's a couple old grizzled guys in the back you know that are on the back corners which oh, is a yeah. hot spot on yeah, like yeah, a, yeah, yeah. a party boat um, and I wobble my way out there, and the mate runs up and says, what are you doing? So 
but I, I, I want to fish. Yeah. You know, I'm a, I'm, I bet I weighed 40 pounds. I mean, I'm, I'm not a big guy anyway. And uh, go out there, and the guy said, well, all right. And so he got a rod, baited everything up, and he told me exactly what to do. And I mean, water's coming over the side. Oh, you know, nasty, people yeah. are getting thrown around. I vividly remember there was a cigarette machine. <laughs> like one of the pull-out thing machines that probably yeah. no one's ever seen. No, no, I've seen um, them. Yeah. So 80s. in inside in like the inside part of the party boat, wow. and pe- someone had fallen into it and gotten thrown into it. All the glass broke and everything. <sighs> so it was unbelievably rough. And this guy, he was an expert, the mate. I thought he was, and he told me exactly what to do, exactly how to maintain the in the pitching seas, you know, the bait at the right level and oh, how wow. many cranks up. On. Nice. I listened to him and he said, just just do this. And I, I remember as a little kid just sitting there doing exactly what he told me and focusing on that little tiny world right in front of me. Wow. And that was it. And I ended up catching like a Ciro mackerel or a Spanish mackerel nice. or something. It was like one of the only things anybody caught. And I just remember just focus on the task at hand, yep. no matter what's going All on. All the chaos and this going on. Yeah. And it helps just whether you're on Champlain or yep. Thousand Islands, waves coming over the yep. front, everything. Just keep your eye on the depth finder or your yep. GPS and just... Just deal with what is in your three foot world, as some people yeah. say, just right in front of you. And, you know, that's that's how I try to deal with things. You got to do it. No yeah. one else is going to do it. It's no not going to get done just looking at it. Absolutely. So, so you, you got to do something. So you qualify for the elites, which mm-hmm. is the top, right? Mm-hmm. As high as you can get. And you've seen all this stuff. You've been through the industry on, um, on in every which angle. So how. When you get here, you know, one of the main things is getting sponsors. How does what you've experienced on the law side with other anglers all these years, how does that influence you now or or four years ago when you're like, okay, now it's time for me to step up and and deal with these companies? Yeah, um, I am very fortunate that I really have um, sponsors that I like a lot. I use almost every bit of their equipment mm-hmm. i mean john knows i may throw yep. some baits other than missile baits i mean yep. he, he knows that yeah um but i use the vast vast majority of everything i've used shimano since i was a little kid mm-hmm. so i'm very happy to be with them i've only run two boats in my life a skeeter and a bass cat nice. that's it since so for for 35 years um so i i really um is that because you're financially able to say this is what I want to do? And yes, yeah. And so I don't have to worry about going from sponsor to sponsor. Mm-hmm. And I like when I when I got on with Shimano, mm-hmm. I felt so lucky because I mean I, I believe that they have a premium product, yep. and I'm, I was very happy to have that happen. And I feel very lucky that I don't have to go out and change to different sponsors, try to start new relationships. Yeah. But, you know, it it's something that a lot of, in fact, all anglers trying to make a living at this are forced into doing. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's just, uh, that's just the way it is. Yep. Do, you, do you have any advice for some of those anglers that are watching, since you do have so much experience dealing with companies uh, on the other side, like, like how to go about it and, and what to look for? I think that <clears throat> like if you weren't in that financial situation yeah um I, I think that you need to go to companies that you truly believe in their product because authenticity is something that comes through no matter in, in any arena that you're dealing in authenticity and true belief in the product and knowledge of the product mm-hmm. is something that people really gravitate towards and they mm-hmm. can just inherently just trust you and they they know that you're not just selling whoever's paying you today right. that's interesting coming from a lawyer <laughs> well, i mean it's you know yeah. it's like it's it. just true it's just the way that that i look at it sure. but I, I i think that unfortunately a lot of people just need to get what they can get yeah and that's a sad state of affairs but it is the reality of right. it unless you in some manner figure out how to um navigate this and i had a i had a a young guy who is a very good angler he's not out here he's not i don't even think he's fishing right now um but very good angler and he uh he ended up going to law school 
and he called me, and I, I, I haven't talked to him now in about a year and a half to see where he is with it, but he asked me, and this probably isn't going to be real popular with a lot of people, but <clears throat> he asked me, tell me what I need to be a pro angler. And I said, you know, and he said, you know, what, do I just need to, you know, master shallow water stuff or live scope? Now I'd probably say live scope. Yeah. But, but you know, what do I need to do? And I said, it isn't anything about fishing that you need to do. It's nothing. I said, what you need is a job that you can go back to yep. after your fishing so you can get 12 weeks off of some job. Yeah. You might have to be self-employed, power washing, start a landscaping anything. business, something. Yep. So you need an, something like that. You need a wife that is gainfully employed mm -hmm. in a good occupation, not a girlfriend, a wife. Mm -hmm. And you also need some source of residual income that is going to keep going even when you're not there to tend to it. Yep. And for me, it's rental properties. Sure. But Smart. so you, you got to have those three things, um, in my opinion, unless you are one of the aforementioned incredible talents yes. that just knock the cover off the ball, yep. which out here, there are probably 20, 25 of them that are just ridiculous um, that, and even that I don't or, get. And yeah. even then they Maybe struggle. 15. Yes. And so, I mean, if, if someone is looking at becoming a professional angler, the skills are just, they just get you in the door. I mean, that, that's just something that you, right. that's a baseline. You that's have got right. to have it. Yep. And that only, unfortunately, comes from time on the water, which, unfortunately, is very costly. Huge I, investment as I, well. I was lucky enough to get it. I mean, I fished probably every other day in high school. After, you know, after school, I just go down to a couple little reservoirs or the CNO Canal that yep. parallels the Potomac River, and I, I would just fish. Um, but then guiding, you know, that I was on the water probably 100, 125 days a year for – 12 years yep so you know mostly on the potomac but other other bodies of water um bugs island the james chickahominy the susquehanna river upper bay um that time on the water is I invaluable yep and especially tidal water fishers teach you so much about yeah about reading water yeah and and it just it's it's something that you can't replace it nope. by watching youtube videos the heck of you an investment yeah and, it, and it's just sheer time mm -hmm. on the water and breadth of conditions and I, I you know and eventually 20 years later you'll look back after fishing tournaments and doing all this stuff and say oh wow i i've been to all these places now you know i mean I've been i may to, have failed there but correct i learned I've been to seminole and yep. i failed now yep. twice out of <laughs> yeah, four times too. i've been here <laughs> yeah. um but you know it's something that eventually you uh you end up getting a broad base diverse base of knowledge and I'm still learning. I've been yep. doing this 40 years, and yep. I throw up two fish yesterday. Yep. I mean, that's that's embarrassing and horrible, but you know, it happens. I guess yep. everybody can. Everybody who fishes can understand that. There's no like one formula. That's what I love about this sport. That's what everyone loves about it. There's no one formula to success. Like in in either way, on the media side or on you know on the water side, it's like you can never like write a book say do this and you. Like the guy, the, the the mate in the back of the boat said, "Do this, you will catch a fish." That's not like always the case, you know. And in, in bass, in pro bass fishing, no. And I, I probably shouldn't be so negative on no, on it, no. but um, that, that's the way that I ended up doing it. It certainly was not the way I tried to do it at first. Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I didn't. I was doing well guiding, and I had a little lure company that I was selling, maybe ten thousand spinner baits and buzz baits a year. But um, you know, I it it sucks money out of you and yeah. so now though people have high school tournaments i mean even you know junior tournaments um college obviously um you know my my son did one of those mm -hmm. we went down to hartwell and that was probably my best tournament experience oh, and wow. i never made a cast oh wow you know watching him and one of my uh, boss's kids oh cool and they ended up second nice. um so, but that that was just that. the cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, they caught a limit of spots in like seven minutes. It was it was awesome. I just wanted them to catch fish, nice. and so we found some fish, and they caught every one of them. But uh, but that was probably my most fun at a tournament. That's yeah, cool. except maybe the classic. That was kind of cool. <laughs> um, but uh, but you know, no, there is no one path. 
there isn't any one way mm -hmm. that uh, people make it, but um, you got to have that trying, baseline. Good, trying to good do people. it on a shoestring budget is uh, you're setting yourself up for some difficult situations, yeah. potentially. On um, on a more macro scale, mm -hmm. is there are there any cases or situations going on in the United States right now that could uh, you see have a severe impact on fishing? that we need to be more cognizant of and get um, involved in? Not, I don't follow that stuff mm -hmm. a lot. I mean, I, I do see from time to time different issues with uh, the banning of lead products um, in certain areas. I mean, that's something that could affect fishing with almost any kind of, you know, hard bait, you know, spinner bait. That's a big thing in the you Northeast. you are a do-it right? molds guy, too, man. Yeah. Look at Ed Social Media. He's always... I'm always messing around Oh, yeah, tinkering. So, you know, and I've, I've been doing that forever as well mm -hmm. um but so i i just really am not in that loop right. and I, i'm not aware of anything but like water um, rights and stuff like that so so that i mean I, I have a good amount of personal experience with with that mm -hmm. um on the james river a number of years ago and this is something that people might be interested in just you know where can you fish and can people ban me from being here or being there um on the james river a number of years ago i was on the main stem of the Appomattox River and there's a marina there and I was just simply going along fishing in the marina and a guy said you know hey this is private you got to get out of here and I said well I I'm just gonna be a couple minutes and I was you know moving like we do um, going through just flipping pilings and stuff and uh, and the guy said no you got to leave now from those pilings on the outside in is private property I said no no it's not <laughs> yeah. and so he proceeded to uh, get really mad and he went and got a garden hose and sprayed like sprayed the boat a little bit hit me sprayed every time I made a cast wow and so um I knew that that was not right and so I called the cops and ultimately brought the guy I mean filed charges against nice. him, cr criminal charges yeah. um for battery um because just like if you spit on a cop, I mean, that, sure. that, you're not touching him, yeah. but a battery is an unwanted yeah. touching. And so when he sprayed, um, you know, I, I had the Commonwealth brand case for battery, but also impeding lawful fishing on a tidal water. Sure. And the majority of states have hunter and fisherman uh, harassment laws. I think there's oh they do oh yeah yeah I think like 37 states wow I always look up the code sections in the states we're giving They're going fishing. to yeah and, nice you know so I got so that on know. a little card in my yeah. wallet very cool <laughs> um so uh I know Florida has one um because I ran into a situation there, there in St. John's um but uh, a couple years ago but so that case ultimately um you know the guy uh was convicted not of the battery I knew that was going to get thrown out um but he was convicted of impeding, impeding lawful fishing on a tidal water because this is where a lot of people are going to have questions and i am only talking about virginia and not rendering legal advice on any other state <laughs> yeah. um, but uh but anytime that you're just on the main body of a river floating your boat yeah, on the water right generally okay but um you know it, it's open to fishing um, so I was just in a marina that was on the main stem. It yeah. was open to fishing. Um, now, if you have a dugout, if you have a pond on your property, land that you own all of it, and there's a pond, or if you dig a hole um, and then connect it to the river, you can exclude people from that. Hmm. Um, but if it's just on the main stem, I mean, it goes back, it's called the public trust doctrine, and it goes back to the Roman Empire that, wow. you know, the the seas and rivers and any navigable waterway is um public you know it, it's public the the government holds it in trust for the benefit of the public mm. and for fishing for navigation for commerce um but there are so many everything is extremely fact specific wow. um you know in virginia there's a case that said that uh the jackson river below this lake lake Moomaw, um is owned by the people who own the land. So entirely 100% owned. You can't go up it, you can't walk up the middle of it, you can't paddle a canoe up it. And that's because there was a deed from B 
before the creation of the United States. Wow. There was a deed, and the Virginia Supreme Court determined that because of the wording in this deed, the King of England Holy had granted this family the entire place, the, the bottom, the riverbed, How about everything. That? But, wow. but it, it, it was a bad case. Yeah. But, um, but that's so there are instances. Louisiana is yeah, tough. You guys are headed to the Sabine this year. Yeah. And, you know, there are questions about there are some anglers that like to push the envelope. And, and so what, what from both standpoints for you guys is, uh, as an angler, what what do you have to look out for, and, and what can happen from a competitor who might want to push the rules a little bit? So, Louisiana, we're not allowed in Louisiana waters, as far as I know. I think it's all Texas because Louisiana has substantial a substantially different situation. They there are oil and gas companies and other private landowners that can exclude you wow. um, from what appear to be navigable public waterways. Yeah. Um, it, like in they, Texas, we always say, if you can float it, you can, you can boat, boat it. it yeah. That's not necessarily true. Um, so if you go into some residential canal in Houston or something, mm-hmm. um, and someone comes out and starts giving you grief, if let's say there's 20 or 30 houses and docks along that canal. If it's a clearly dug out canal and there was no previous creek or something there, but it's a, definitely a man-made thing, it's possible wow. that they could own that water but they would have to have a deed that said that in a big development like that it's rare that it ever happens wow um so but it's possible Mm -hmm. but unfortunately only a a deed um would probably tell you that so but but in general as an angler right so say someone goes in uh catches fish in there um but another angler had tried to go in there one day and someone told him this is private but but then the the angler that catches them says i was never told that so as a competitor say you were the competitor that was told you have to leave and then you come find out someone caught them <laughs> oh em. man that's well, how do you feel about that i mean if i were the competitor that left um protested that. I, well it probably would be best to bring it to the attention of bass because uh like the marina on cayuga that one halfway down on the Is that the one ha- west side. Yeah. He got? yeah. He he got DQ'd, I believe, for being in that marina. He didn't get DQ'd because you're not allowed to fish in that marina. He got DQ'd, I believe, because BASS put it off limits. Yeah, it was because on they the just didn't want the hassle. Yeah. Yeah. Because they didn't want us to be in there among the mm-hmm. sailboats or whatever it was. So I would bring it to the attention of the tournament director, the mm-hmm. canal in Houston that we're talking about that you get thrown out of. Because what if someone, you know, is fishing down there. There are no signs. Mm-hmm. There's no no trespassing signs. Right. There's nothing. And, you know, a person just comes out on their dock and says, hey, don't don't fish in here. I don't want you to fish in here. So you, you can't fish in here. Okay, and you leave. I mean, that... So the angler should reach out to Bass and say, okay, today I was told I couldn't fish in here. Um, they don't want us in there. And then Bass should probably let all anglers know, okay, we're going to make this off limits. If I were BASS, I would immediately contact whoever the Department of Wildlife or whatever Mm -hmm. you call it in Texas is. And I would say, hey, here's the canal. Is that a private canal? Mm -hmm. Is it known to be a private canal? Can, Can people be excluded? And if, which they probably would, they probably would know. Right. Um, and if they say, no, it's fine. Then you just, send out an email like we get from Lisa from time to time saying you can go in the fifth street canal or whatever it's called. Yeah. Um, But BASS could just say, then it's off limits. Right. But that, that really doesn't assert fishermen's rights, which BASS purports to care about access to fishing. Right. Um, So, you know, I mean, all these are very tough because every issue is so fact specific Mm -hmm. when you're dealing with water rights and it it doesn't come up that much but you know you can't you can't keep people from fishing around your dock so typically what do we just which they went to the red river in the opens but do we just continue to ignore louisiana (laughs) even though it's got some of the best bass fishing in the country like are we is our organization do you know of anyone who's putting pressure on louisiana to to fix this I travel with Derek Hudnell, Mm -hmm. who's from Louisiana, and he has said that for years, anglers and, I guess, duck hunters and stuff have been trying to get something changed, but 
Um, much of it, I, it, it sounds like, and I don't know this for a fact, but it sounds like a lot of it goes back to the oil and gas industry. And the money they've got. And the money. And also the changing nature of, of the delta, I guess, for lack of a better term down there. Yeah. That different areas, I mean, they, they get built up. Right. They get taken down and mm -hmm. suddenly there's water in them, you know, and it, right. it, it varies. And so Louisiana is a tough cookie. And, and I would imagine that we will continue to avoid it, except maybe a yeah. lake. So yeah. out, are yeah. there any other states outside of Louisiana that are, that are tricky? Because that's the one we always hear of. But have you come? I would say that's the trickiest. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it, any one could be tricky. Mm -hmm. Like there were I think there was a. I don't know what tournament it was, but it was on Oneida a number of years ago, mm -hmm. and Zell Roland got disqualified. I remember that. I know the spot, too. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I mean, I believe it's up, I forget the name of the creek, mm -hmm. um, but it's a naturally deep, winding creek, and off it, there were little dugout canals um, that were made. Is that yeah generally it, correct yes but it also looks very natural it's correct. got a natural bank on it <laughs> yeah. because correct. i fished it and yeah. then found out that yeah i fished it in a in practice sure. talked to a competitor yeah. about hey and they were like yeah you can't fish in there yeah N new york's funny they uh they, they definitely um seem to exclude people more will willingly than than other states at least in some of the bodies of water like there, there's not much problem on lake champlain mm -hmm. um you know which is half vermont half new york um i don't recall any real problems on the st lawrence um but it, it really is anywhere and as long as you can and this doesn't apply to any like corps of engineer lakes mm -hmm. they they pretty much own it and they can tell you you can't come in this marina or that marina yeah. like they do i think it bull shoals and a couple other ones right um so they they can ban you but it's it's really the whole area of law surrounding access is very fact specific and a big mishmash of sure not really well settled law when you get to really weird situations that that hackney um situation i, I i've seen people comment you know bass had it out for hackney and i, I like hackney i i think he's a uh i think he's great for this sport but also, back then, I remember being like, it was on the SOE that y if you yeah. read it, you couldn't fish it. So it, it, there was no gray area. It was black and yeah. white. That, yeah, but that. my point of bringing that one up is just that um, BASS can make anything they want off mm -hmm. limits. Right. Um, and so if there is a question leaving a gray area for tournament fishermen, it's best to remove gray areas. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? So And even that doesn't help sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> yeah. sometimes there are walls that people will simply blow yeah. through or cast beyond or yeah. whatever they wish to do mm -hmm. are so. there any rules uh at bassmaster that that you see uh taken advantage of a lot by anglers that uh that stick out to you that you're like why don't they tighten that up or or that you're like that's gonna cause a headache if they don't do something no, not really i mean i have a personal belief from different things that I hear mm -hmm. um, and I heard it again last night from someone who would would know that it uh, I believe people get information mm -hmm. oh, um, thousand percent and, and I'm, I'm really bothered by that when yeah. I'm sitting there putting up two fish yesterday mm -hmm. whereas I could just call some people that yeah. I mean the guy that I sold my last boat to I mean he, he lived he here. lived here right yeah. so I mean but but we work our asses I don't do it and, yeah. and you know and and without Without enforcement, the people that are doing the right thing eventually may give in to doing the wrong thing. Sure. Um, if someone is if you're desperate, desperate sure. enough, stakes are high. Sure. When, when the stakes are high and people are having difficulty financially mm -hmm. or requalifying for the elites, people start making pretty bad decisions. People it's human will, nature, sure. You know, come in on you, or people will yep. start doing all kinds of yep. sketchy stuff. And so, I, I really wish that. I were more confident that people were not getting information, but yeah. just from what I heard last night, it, it sounds like there's it's no rampant. question. It's rampant and for sure. One but thing, one thing about bass fishermen, right? They they talk they talk a lot, and there's always rumors, right? I mean, so is it rumor or is it fact? And yeah. that's why you, I mean, someone like you, you you do a good job separating rumor from but fact. But how do you manage that, right? So there's a thing called polygraph. I've always said there needs to be more, but from a lawyer's standpoint. You know, there's someone I know that's felled polygraphs, and so I assume he's got a pretty good lawyer. So, so how do does Bass do the polygraph thing, and then how do 
does the polygraph even count when push comes to shove? I mean, push comes to shove means whether or not BASS is going to disqualify you. Because they're De a privately yeah. owned company, yeah. right? I mean, so if, if you um, answer a question and, and it indicates that you are not being truthful, mm -hmm. then I guess BASS can disqualify you. But I also, I remember, I've only had to do one polygraph, and that was years and years and years ago at, at a tournament that was on the Potomac River, ironically, it was like a policeman's benefit tournament. And so the, <laughs> cop, the cops were giving, were giving, uh, giving me and my partner, the that's polygraph, awesome. we got second in the tournament, um, but it was a big tournament. And I even remember back then, I was like, these are horrible questions mm -hmm. you're asking. The way they're written. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're just, uh, they're, am they're ambiguous. Yeah. A lot of them don't make sense. They're, they're just so I assume that the BASS ones are probably the same. Like, I mean, yes. if you ask me, like in this tournament, if you ask me, did you break any, I don't know what they ask, but mm -hmm. right. did you break any rules? I mean, that, that's a ridiculous question. Right. I mean, you know, because if I say no, and then I think to myself, oh, geez, I, I, had, sped I, I, I had to switch my, no, because this happened to me. I had to switch my gas tank from one to the next, so I had to undo my kill switch, right. yeah. you know, at, at the jacket. Right. I go back there, I switch it, and then I get back on, and I run up the lake and whatever, and then I go to get up, and nothing's tugging at me. Right. I look down at my kill switch, not yeah. not hooked to my jacket. Right. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I mean, is that... So how do you answer that question truthfully, yeah. you know? I mean, yeah, yeah I, I didn't have my kill switch hooked up for 10 minutes, Yeah. you know, right. but, yeah. but it was it was an accident, it wasn't intentional, and, right. you know, but I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe they'll DQ me from this tournament right. and I'll lose my three valuable points <laughs> <laughs> that I got. <laughs> so, uh. um, but, you know, so I, I, I really would, I would hope that BASS does a very good job of asking the questions, but whoever is writing the questions, yeah. they may not, they may not be good at it or yeah. they may not be tournament anglers. So we had a situation, I'll talk about it. Um, we won't name names. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and we were told the person passed the polygraph, but the evidence was just there for, uh, Chris had a, a marshal. You can be quiet. You all say it all. He had a marshal. Chris caught him really good day one in this tournament. Was leading was, it, I think. Yeah. was in competition, like, yeah, to win, um, drew the marshal that happened to be the biggest, one of the biggest sticks on the lake someone else in competition to win. They pass by the guy points him. He goes, Oh, he's got all my juice. And the guy's real open to talk to Chris because he just sacked him up. It, it, and uh, this that guy's got all my juice. And I think Chris felt him out a little bit. He didn't say it like that. He said this: the guy who ended up winning the tournament was fishing an area like across from me in the distance. And he's like, "Oh, he's on that spot." He goes, "He goes, uh, he goes, he goes. I wonder why he's on that spot." He goes, "He's got all my latest stuff. Like he's got all my best stuff." And and that's weird that he's on that area. And I'm just like, "Wow, this guy's either really trying to impress me with his knowledge of the lake, or you know, he was unintentionally calling his boy out. You know, and and I brought it to Bass's attention. And everything he ended up passing. So the, he the passed polygraph, the polygraph, but, but but what a new rule was written, and but but what. I was told was he followed this guy around. The guy fished uh, the weekend before cutoff, and he followed the guy around so he could see in a tournament, could see all his goods. And so he got all that information. And as far as he was concerned, he, he legally got it, even though his intention was to use that information in y'all's tournament 30 days later. It was publicly available. Exactly. For exactly. following it around. The word intention was, was never in the rules back then, I believe. That whole intention thing. That and, and it was how it's written. So a new rule came out. The yeah. public never heard of it. You know, it was not but talked about. But I, I mean, the intent wouldn't change with that. Really? Be yeah, because, I mean, who, who cares what the intent is? It's publicly available information. Like when I am online before tournaments looking, you know, at yeah, tournament right. results or old videos on YouTube sure. or something. I am intentionally yeah. trying to look at things yep. to gain a fishing advantage yep. and understand a body of water. With public information. It's publicly available. Yeah. and We all do it. And yeah. kind of as we just talked about, the lake's a public place. Yep. If you want to hump your butt down there 30 days, prior. 30 days before and follow the dude around. Public info. You can do it. Yep. I can do it. Yep. Everybody can do it's it. True. Um, so it's public info. And so... 
I mean, I, I don't I don't think there's any way. Guy goes on to win it. By to, the way. I don't think there's any way to avoid that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless you just have a sheer cutoff of nothing. Right. right. You can't. Right. You can't. You know. You can't be on the water at all. You know. Yeah. Um, that would eliminate that issue. Um, yeah. My biggest thing is like currently um, with social media nowadays, right? I mean, like every, everything. You know, the FS1 live, all the Instagram clips are 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 projected even after day one of a tournament, like we'll use this one, for example, uh, the new guy, Safuentes, the guy with the cowboy hat. Mm -hmm. uh, I was scrolling Instagram this morning. Of course, I didn't make the cut, but if I was fishing today, I saw last night, I was just scrolling Instagram. I saw him drop shotting trees, you know, with forward facing sonar. And, you know, of course I thought about it in practice, but you know, if I wanted to go try that the next day, would that make me guilty of, of you know, uh, intentionally, uh, I guess benefiting from this Instagram clip because, you know, if I were just to go out on day three, uh, you know, and continue to do my thing, punching grass or whatever it is and in, in, in finishing 70th or whatever, um, or, you know, use that information that I saw last night and go try drop shot in trees with forward facing sonar, that would make me guilty, would it not? Well, it's, I, I would, I would say probably. Yeah. Um, because it happens. You, your your intent was not. You didn't go out looking for it. If you were just scrolling through, no, it. frankly, yeah. I just don't think you ought to be on it. No, I, yeah. I, I think they should. I don't think we should be on social media. Period. Um, during a tournament. During a tournament. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if you want to post something, fine, but yep. don't look at don't anything. Don't look. Yeah. And the only thing I ever look at is bass track and the leaderboard. Mm -hmm. Bass track, like when I'm, you know, in, in line sure. or something, sure. or the leaderboard, obviously, just see where the cut's going to be. Yeah. That's all I ever look at. I mean, I don't I don't go on social media I, during during tournaments, but there's, I mean, I, I, I think that you probably should get some kind of significant penalty for that yeah. because you didn't intentionally seek it out. Mm -hmm. But then you acted on something that sure. you didn't intentionally sure. if, see. I'm telling you, it happens, man. Like these tournaments, I know, I know where what happens. Top water doesn't work. You see a guy catching on top water in a, in a clip, and all of a sudden everyone's throwing top water. It's yeah. like how, like how, yeah, like why? So yeah. how do we manage that though? More polygraphs? <laughs> like how do we? Because it's happening. Everyone knows it's happening. I've seen him. I saw one tournament. This is a few years ago. He he caught him on a spoon. Big they, spoon, yeah. And then. Literally at takeoff the next day, yeah. all you saw were yeah, spoons, and I was exactly. like, "This is so yeah. out of control." Mm -hmm. I mean, word spreads. Yeah, that yeah, too. That so, like, how I mean, do you manage it? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I would imagine the only way is to tell people that you can't be on social media that's it. and that you can't be on the Bassmaster website except for the sole purposes of looking at um, placement, the leaderboard, yeah. or. AOI or yeah. Bass Track, you know, those kind of but things that don't give you an indication necessarily. But then of who's again, doing how what. do you manage it? No, because yeah. we have all these rules. We have no information rules, but it does not, everyone's still getting information. Then you have to, like you said, I mean, just start doing more polygraphs. And unfortunately, um, someone's going to have to be made an example of. Yeah. And, you know, there's no, there's no slapping on the wrist or, you know, fines and other organizations that i hear just people just <laughs> blow through they just say well i'll just pay the fine it's easier oh, yeah. than not financially it makes <laughs> sense fish. yeah paying five hundred dollars and winning a right. hundred grand sign me up right yeah. and so you know? people will do that but you know when you you when you zero someone out for a tournament and that takes away you know their chance of making the classic or doing yeah. whatever um you know and you stick them with a fine that shows that things are serious because without enforcement of laws i mean we see what goes on around this country. Mm -hmm. right. We don't enforce laws yeah. that are on the books. Mm -hmm. um, it gets chaotic. Get, yeah, I mean, that that's what separates us from the animals. We yeah. have rules and laws that we agree to abide by. And, you know, this country for a long time has done decently um, by having a good legal framework and people adhering to general societal norms of yeah. rules and laws and and unfortunately when you just say well you can take up to 900 bucks worth of stuff and we're not going to prosecute you i mean they the might as well take 900 cr cr criminals yeah. get real good at math real quick yeah yeah they're running out the door with you know 875 dollars worth of stuff right 
All of right. a sudden they can count. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, you know, and, and this, this is maybe no different. Um, but I, I think that, yeah, the, the only answer, I guess, is is polygraph. So at the end of last year, there was a bunch of morale seemed to be down. You know, uh, it was around the time of uh, y'all having that meeting at the end of the year. There were lots of things going on. One of them, it came out that there were some wives texting um with their significant others, you know, you, you need to leave that spot. You're going to miss weigh in, things like that. Wives were openly admitting. Is that it. fact? Yes, the wives said they did it. it that's the wives. fact. And like a wives group or something? <laughs> Look, the RV community talks. Okay. Gotcha. Anyway, so I had to talk to, you know, Bass after the fact, not specifically about that, but I said, dude, you know, obviously people aren't feeling any heat when it comes to the rules, right? And and there's a new generation in, so so why don't y'all do more polygraphs? Or, or if that's what they said, maybe we just need to do more polygraphs. And I'm like, yeah, do it, you know? Like, it's the, might as well. And they said, but that, what we would have to charge entry fees a little more. Do you feel that that's right? Or do you feel like the, as the organization, their job if they're taking these entry fees is to protect anglers and, and that should be a part. It's, it, it's, they need to make sure that the rules are adhered to and everybody is on a level playing field. Right. Um, you know, do you think that the raising an entry fee? No, I, I don't see that that would be necessary. I mean, once you have a polygrapher there, what's yeah. the difference really materially, what's the difference after he sets everything up? to one bring verse. four people in as yeah. opposed to one yeah. yeah i mean you know maybe it's an extra two hours of time i mean i have no idea but how much is that 500 bucks that's what i was like so no it's it, that that's a uh that's a crap rationale that's, that's garbage what i thought i was and going uh, really taken your, aback by it your no, rv wives group when you see something hear something you got to report that man but we're not we're not tournament anglers we can't report it that that's actually how y'all's well, world works. Next time it happens, you give me evidence I doubt and that. I take it. Uh, I mean, so you're telling me that BASS would not take right. a complaint from a person, right? Yeah, on a I, dock? Just, so yeah. I found out about it like way after the fact or when I did. But what I was told was one of the wives did bring it to attention, or someone did, and Bass may have asked for names and they didn't give them at the time. You know. Um, they just said, it, and it wasn't just one wife. It was apparently multiple wives that hadn't been around before the split. They didn't, they didn't understand. Like that is like, well, like you can't, like, you can't tell your husband, come on, good, can pick it up, things like that. If you see they're doing bad on Bass Track, and that apparently was going on. Yeah, I mean, I, I would never get a text like that from Allison. No. Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, because yeah. she just, does, you know, I mean. She follows it, right? Um, but but it's not like she would contact me during a during tournament. A she tournament, would, right. I yeah. mean, unless it's an emergency, unrelated yeah, of to course. fishing, right. you know, or I mean, maybe. Oh my God, there's a tsunami coming, sure. and it's right. going to bowl you over at the Sabine or sure. something. Right. I, mean, I, I don't know, but other than that, I mean, I, I can't imagine that there would be any reason to contact somebody um, yeah. in, in in that way. I mean, that just doesn't right. make any it's sense crazy, to me. Huh? But but, the, but, thing, but things need to be tightened up but I, I believe that bass um does not like a lot of uh feathers to be ruffled yeah and i think that and they have good good evidence of this that oh it'll pass yeah because yeah. most everything does pass yeah right and do you think a it's because the next week you know, and the there week are ang that, and there are more one. anglers that'll come in right? oh yeah i mean you don't like it you can leave yeah. i mean yeah. we got a hundred and well we have 250 others at least that want to probably get in right here. amazing um so it's it's a very powerful position that bass is in mm -hmm. and uh you know and they uh they're gonna do and what major league fishing obviously too business. both organizations you know yeah because you know again major league fishing i mean you know at their top level uh events i mean there are there's a line of 200 people that want to yeah. get into those um and Lord knows where they get the money to do this. How do you <laughs> advise an angler if they if they're like, okay, this is wrong. I want to take the organization on. And and you hear it around here, you know that you're gonna get blackballed if you try and do that. Like, what? 
how do you even handle that? That's the power that BASS and its affiliates have. Yeah. Um, and you, I mean, ultimately. Is that because we don't have a players union? Do we need to have a players union? I mean, what's a players union going to do? I mean, if you if you have, you know, Patrick Mahomes or something, right. say, well, I'm leaving, that might have an impact. Right. Frankly, if Ed Lochran or even Chris Zaldane says, I'm leaving, I, I just I just don't know that that's going to have a giant impact on a decision that they have made. Right. right. And, you know, because there's 200 other people yep. that yeah. are, that are out there waiting. Yep. And so I, I don't, I don't know that that would help. I mean, I, I just don't know. I mean, th that happened 2018, end of 18 and going into 19, there was a bunch of guys left. I mean, and, you know, over some decisions or whatever that, that Bass had made or promises, empty promises, right? We just had Chase on and, and that's mm -hmm. what he was, you know, he was saying, but really what's changed? It seems like we're like, we're right there. And those guys, some of those guys are right back. Yeah. It's because, um, I mean, it's not a monopoly, but it's a duopoly. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, no, no, uh, shade to be cast at the MPFL, but it, it really is a duopoly between yep. um, MLF and BASS, and those, th those are the only two games in town. Yep. Um, but it, it, would be, uh, it would be nice if things were uh, done a little bit differently. Um, but again, at the same time, BASS has to make money. And I mean, I, I have, you know, I know that some people probably think that BASS has a a safe in their office that is just packed with stacks and stacks Chase of bills. Said that to exact a, same thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I told that to him. I yep. said people think that. Yep. And I said I, I know that's not the case. No companies are like that. Nope. Yeah. And he said, Yeah, no. I mean, we we run. He literally said to me, We run a very lean operation, as yep. I would expect him to, as as a history of a, an operator of yep. a business. Um, and and so it's something that. It's not a bottomless pit of money, and BASS has to make money. I mean, it's a for-profit business, yep. um, and so it's a constant tug between what would be great for the anglers versus what would be great for the organization. And unfortunately, sometimes those two things cannot meet. Yep. They can't. I mean, would it be great if we had no entry fees? And like, uh, like Hackney told me, he said, you go to work, you ought to get paid. And should everybody get paid and we shouldn't have entry fees? Yeah, that'd be great. It's not a sustainable model in the current environment. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there would have to be millions that would come into the coffers of BASS through sponsorship dollars yeah. in order to be able to do that. And that just has not been able to happen to this point. Nope. So, and I, and I, and will I, that ever I happen? I haven't seen it happen in 40 years and people yep. have been talking about it for 40 years. Yep. I mean, I, I was, I was at the, it was either the 1989 or 1990 classic, probably the nine, 1990 classic on the James river. And I had become friends with Joe Thomas mm -hmm. and he was fishing that tournament. And so before cut off, I took him around oh, just nice. because I mean, I was 19 years old, but sure. I, I knew the James better than he did. Sure. Um, so, and during that, tournament that is when i believe helen severe owned bass and i believe the first place prize was fifty thousand dollars and the all-american at that time was a hundred thousand and so there was talk of striking and not appearing at the classic wow. like all the anglers but unfortunately you know the couple guys would be like well if if there's only five of us there, I got like a one in five <laughs> chance. chance. And 50K. so, and, and so ultimately yep. it just doesn't, it doesn't work because we're not on yep. a team. Yep. I mean, I try to work with you and a couple other people and just say, you know, what, what I'm doing. Yep. Um, and, but ultimately this is an individual sport. And so it's, um, it, it's hard to think how a lot of advances are really gonna, gonna happen. Yep. It's difficult say the least yeah I like you said 40 years I mean that's I I believe I mean I the whole entry fee thing right MLF tried it you know I mean that's that's a huge income for you know for for it's not even income operate, it's cash flow well cash flow operating costs right, right? yeah to operate I mean yeah. that's and I mean 
obviously it wasn't sustainable. I mean, how, how long did they make it? Two years without entry fees yeah. as an angler? Yeah. And, and it, it's just not, there need, there need to be sponsors that come in that see enough value in the reach that we have yeah. that they can assign to it a metric that is quantifiable and they can say, Hey, that moved the dial. And I can tell you the only clear example that I've seen because it used to be Chevy was the sponsor of like FLW and everything. People got Suburbans. I mm -hmm. mean, you know, it, it was, you know, the top, top anglers would be on teams and stuff. Mm -hmm. All of that, um, they were the deal, Chevy was. But the only big sponsor that I've seen, now they're pretty much gone as a sponsor, but the one I've seen that has made an impact without question and it's been from their outdoor marketing is Toyota. Mm -hmm. There is no question in my mind that because of their sponsorship of BASS and other outdoor oriented um, organizations, that Toyota has seriously moved the needle on the sales of their Tundras, Tacomas, and then all the ancillary stuff that the wives and kids and everybody sure. else gets, the Highlanders, sure. the Forerunners, mm -hmm. the you know, all that stuff. But they're pretty much out. And it seems to, I, I, I watched, you know, when the split happened and everything got fractured, the support with anglers of Tundra usage seemed to fizzle. It, it seems to have fizzled a little bit, but I think that what has happened is it's gotten out beyond just anglers. Mm -hmm. And so now it's sort of viral. You sure. know, I mean, I, I've got a Tundra out there. Sure. And it's a 2015. There's it's got 175,000 miles, and it's it is still, still rolling. Still rolling, mm -hmm. yeah. and so it's a great value. Yeah, that gets bad gas mileage. Sure. But other than that, I mean, it has a ton <laughs> it of power. Time, yeah. It starts every time. Yeah. Things don't break. I yeah. mean, I literally have had knock on wood, nothing break on that thing in 175,000 miles, and I use it just for going to tournaments. There are a lot Do of new tundras out there this yeah, year. There really there are. are. Yeah. And so, but but the the Japanese in general have a different look at things and they play a very long game mm -hmm. um just that society in general and i think that's the right game to play in in life really but they invested a lot of money and i think it has paid dividends but it's taken 15 years 15 years but they run the numbers and they know well, we want to be in that segment. Yeah. We want to be in the full size truck segment. Yeah. So we have a great truck and how do we get it out there the cheapest way possible? And they know the demographics. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I know growing up, um, you know, in the eighties, uh, there were no non Toyota. Toyota. They, they, no, no, no Toyota trucks. I mean, they were tiny. Of. Yeah. Yeah. They were T100 little, or whatever yeah, in the 90s. That or came late in the late 90s. Yeah, late 90s. So, and, and no, nobody that follows bass fishing or hunts or anything would dare drive Not even. One. Not even a chance. They were driving Chevys, Ford, yep. Dodges. That's oh, yeah. It. And so now it has totally changed. Mm -hmm. And I believe that that is because of the extremely effective marketing yep. tactics of Toyota and especially, um, dynamic sponsorships mm -hmm. you know um, i mean company, i i yeah. bought a i bought a forerunner that i would you know really for my wife to use but in those local like tbf federation tournaments i would drag my bass cat around with it and go fish those tournaments i won 29 some odd thousand dollars in toyota bonus bucks did you really yep, almost paid That's for the truck huge because wow. you get money for making a state team yep you get money for going to the national you'd make money for being the highest finisher at the wow. national and the all-american and so i mean over over the span of four or five years that added up to 30 grand wow almost, almost paid for and it. so yeah and so they they and i know a lot of people that made decisions based off yep. of that it really helped kick them over the edge as opposed to going with a different product yeah so interesting that, but then they and i know it's not toyota but then they appear to have backed off the toyota texas bass fest but yeah. i think that was a distributor of yeah. toyotas yeah that that's their goal. gulf state gulf is the yeah. the largest and that too was the first uh importer and and really right. who put toyota on the map in in america yeah from what and I so understand. they they pulled out and that mm -hmm. that frankly is something that um i've looked at and when they pulled out all of a sudden we had the same amount of entry fees and we had the same amount essentially that bass was putting in but we have one more tournament 
mm-hmm. yeah. because Toyota was basically funding that that tournament virtually that whole sure. tournament right and so you know I, I, I just I think that there are ways because I've run the numbers and if I don't know if it's wise or not and what the consequences or ramifications would be but I, if we go back to an eight tournament season I mean maybe people want more but if we went back to an eight tournament season uh, season and everything else remained equal the payouts could go up a pretty decent yeah amount. so you understand both numbers you are a statistic minded human yes. which is rare yeah. in bass fishing I love <laughs> um, and you see this a lot from fans okay y'all have the payout's been 100k for years and years and years True. do you blame bass for that or is that just the nature of the beast and the economic situation that we're faced in in our sport um i I think that bass has an obligation to at least try to um move the help move the ball forward for tournament payouts um Mm -hmm. and whether it's paying deeper you know um or whether it's no entry fees or reduced entry fees or something mm-hmm. like that. But um, I, there are little tweaks, and ev- everybody has just slightly different ideas. Mm-hmm. And there are, you know, there's 104 anglers, there's five or 10 people at BASS who yeah. look at it, and everybody has a little different idea. But, you know, if you went to an, an eight tournament season mm-hmm. and you kept the same entry fees total, Mm-hmm. Um, you know, would bump it up to like fifty, five hundred dollars a tournament or something. They kept putting in the same amount of money. Um, AOY, I, I don't, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to have AOY pay out down to fortieth. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that makes any sense. Top mm-hmm. twenty, no. top ten, top ten. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because I mean, yeah. the guys that are in twenty uh, seventh or thirty yeah. fifth in AOY. They've already done pretty well yep. for the year. But exactly. it isn't so, like, yeah. you know, but, but if you took all that money, which is probably a couple hundred grand, yeah. mm-hmm. um, and you put that in back into the tournaments, tournament winnings, especially yeah. only eight tournaments, um, and you just did little tweaks here and there, you know. Um, so would you tweak the payout or would you tweak uh, entry I'd, fees? I'd tweak the payout. Um, Upper ends or through the field? Top end? The model that I did gets everyone paid mm-hmm. um who participates um but you know e- and even that's by removing that that extra tournament yeah um but i understand and i realize that you know any deal that bass does with fox or somebody you lose you know, the engagement numbers. yeah of, of that additional tournament that's so, so I, I mean and, and so i get that yeah. um so I, I don't know how to work that out but you know i do believe that something you know we, we do need to try to figure out how to get higher entry fees because or excuse me higher uh, payouts but it's no different than like sponsors that i have i mean if i'm getting x number of dollars of equipment you know um and they don't increase it this year or last year but they increase their prices right um and the sponsorship that i get was based off of msrp right i just got a 10 percent reduction yep in what uh-huh. i'm what i'm getting right, right. so th- the inflation stuff has affected payouts a hundred thousand i mean it sounds ridiculous but a hundred thousand dollars isn't what it used to be no, well, no it's not yeah. not remotely so i mean you know af- after taxes and everything it's been like that since 06 when the, when yeah. the elite series was born you yeah know? and and so I'd, i i think at that time espn was involved yeah and they I think because they were flush with money, um, and this was relatively small potatoes to them, mm-hmm. they were able to kick in a lot of money, and it was not a good financial business decision. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and so just because they set a standard back then... Doesn't mean it was smart. Doesn't Correct. mean it was right or sustainable. Correct. The sustainability right. of something so is you what like has to be looked at. So you feel like we finally evened out. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Because, I mean, I don't know, and no one's ever going to be privy to BASS's books. Yeah. Right. But, I mean, I don't perceive that they are just Being making money hand over yeah. fist yeah. and stuff. But, yeah. unfortunately, um, that's what a lot of anglers think. And think. The, the sheer scope of what BASS has to do, 
I mean, just to put the event on over here at the boat base it's and here in Bainbridge. The amount of people, people everything. fuel, the hotels that people have. To, now, I realize a lot of the hotels get comped and stuff. But right. I, but still, that's, the a, chamber that's of a huge operation it's outside. Huge. Of, yeah. It's giant. Yeah. And, and Weekly, ev- too. This week, then the next yeah. week. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so it's never ending. So it is a very, because there are a lot of humans involved. You can't yeah. automate a lot of that. No. Yeah. Um, so it, it's just expensive. It is. And so to put on a good big show with quality production it just costs a lot of money and because of that if they need to make x percent return on their investment um you know something's gonna give and it's it's gonna be us yeah yeah, one thing chase brought up (laughs) last time that was the last person we sat down with i should have watched that yeah well he said you know we yes we're a sport yes we get compared to other major sports but we don't have tv rights deals and that's where the big money comes from so we're operating like you said when you talk to him Mm -hmm. you know in a very lean efficient manner for what the parameters that we're dealing with but most people don't understand that they think we're hoarding money and yeah. we've got all this you know profit that we're we're just not giving to the anglers yeah and i mean i know you all have been there mm-hmm. but you know bass headquarters i mean it's you, you don't you don't fancy. go into you know a giant a bass gold plated bass no. building no no you know i mean it is it, it is office a space. it's office space basic office space. It's, yeah. it's basic office space it looks efficient mm-hmm. it looks responsible mm-hmm. it looks lean it looks proper people yeah. aren't walking around with gold rolexes no and, and there's you know there's there there's no yoga room and yeah. a cafeteria <laughs> i mean it, you know it, yeah. it, it's not it it is a small business mm-hmm. and it appears to be by my judgment an efficiently run tight ship that operates uh, in a proper manner. And Chase, with his history as an operator of operator, businesses, yeah. I mean, that's what he is good at. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I believe that they probably do a good job uh, marshalling the business for the benefits of its shareholders, which is the duty. Mm-hmm. You know, the, yeah. the, big, the big phrase now is for, you know, to operate a business for the stakeholders. Right. stakeholders. And the anglers would be stakeholders. That's not yeah. how it works. No. Yeah. That's yeah. not how it, sh- not, it should yeah. work, in my opinion. Right. Yeah. That's not how it should work. It's the shareholders. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I believe that they are operating for the benefit of the shareholders. And, you know, they're not trying to slight us or, no, or right. screw us over. Right. But, um, you know, they can't just go to $200,000 payouts. And just because we want it. And they can't just go to right. $2,500 entry fees. Yeah. So the shareholders like, whoa, 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 <laughs> wait a second. So yeah. when, the sure. sp- when the split happened, obviously the anglers involved in the split weren't going to go tell the public we think we need more money, right? Like they're trying to – but what we heard behind the scenes, there were a lot of the older vet people who were saying, you know, I should be able to retire and have much more in my bank account than I do. Let me say something about that. So when I fished the Invitationals back in 1994, um, I cashed checks in three of the four that there were. And for a couple years, I would get a statement at the end of the year that showed my retirement with BASS. They would pull money out of every time that you did. Oh, wow. I I guess every time you got a check that they would throw in, I don't know, 250 bucks or something. Oh, wow. And so there was some kind of... Shared plan somewhere. Shared plan of some sort. Huh. I was 25 at the time. I didn't know anything. Yeah, no, right. I, and I you still don't know where it is. Wow. Well, no, no. I mean, I'm sure it did not vest. And so yeah. I'm sure it reverted to the entity, to uh-huh. BASS, right. because I only fished the Opens that one year. And after two or three years, I stopped getting these, wow. these statements. So there was at one point in time... A shared Because plan. you got to think about it. Back then, I mean, it was the... Cluns, the Nixons, who are still here, mm-hmm. um, Browers, and all, all those, you know, big names. Hmm. And I, I, I never met Ray Scott. I don't know. But, I mean, my perception was that, I mean, I don't, I don't think he wanted to screw them over. I mean, I think he probably wanted to do right by them. And so there was something in place back wow. then. Wow. Um, but that, that is something that did exist at one point hmm. in time. So it's possible. But it was back then. Yeah. But their complaint, right, that and, and that, that they 
they told the young guys, we should be making more money, the payouts should be better, you shouldn't be paying entry fees. From a business standpoint, was that even, is it even possible like that? Because I never thought it did, running the numbers and looking at what I knew. You, you know, we like you said, no one will ever know the books. We only can assume some things. What was that? Um, and that was seemed to be the top complaint that wasn't being publicly spoke about. Is that even possible in our sport? I mean, like I, I just looked. It looks... I'm just going to do the math real quick I on like, how much. Math. 104 anglers. I mean, it's $4.68 million in, in entry, entry fees. fees. We pay. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's totally doable. No entry fees and the payout stays the same. Absolutely doable. Go find $5 million. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, Ed. So, I mean, that, that's We it. have to sell $5 million bucks yeah. somewhere. But... $5 million to a lot of companies is, is nothing. Yeah. Um, what they need to see is a return. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of the entities that we deal with in the industry, they just don't have that kind of money. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. it, yeah, it would definitely have to come from a outside. A non-endemic. What are we outside. talking? We're so, talking, so $5 million in, what are we talking, a $10 million return? Are we talking a you know, $7.5 million return for it to make sense for some of these companies that, you know, poten you know potential well, I, companies? I guarantee you Toyota, uh, I can't guarantee you, but I, right. I believe that Toyota probably for a decade, if not longer, was way negative, like way negative in their investment. But, you know, now it's starting to catch on. Yeah. Ameri um, publicly traded American companies don't have the stomach to operate on that kind of time horizon. Mm. They operate on quarterly results. Right. It's, it's here and now. That is a difference in society that you're not going to be in the corporate society. I don't think you're going to be able to overcome. From yeah. a corporate standpoint, too, dealing with our demographic, does our demographic move the needle in a, from a corporate Absolutely. standpoint? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, I almost am the demographic. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I, I recall that our demographic, our main demographic is like our average is 49 year old guys who are married and have a kid or two and make 50 to a hundred thousand mm dollars. -hmm. I think that is our demographic and that demographic, in addition to making this country operate, um, also, <laughs> um, you know, spends a decent amount of money. Mm -hmm. Um, but what do we spend it on and yeah. do we spend enough money on leisure activities right. related to the industry or do we have to, look beyond that and you know where where do we get it why why don't we have i mean everybody's got a phone why, why don't why don't we have more you know phone sponsors or something oh, yeah. like that or why why don't we you know but going back to toyota which i think is the frankly only successful example i believe that they knew okay all these jokers they're going to buy some trucks but then their wives they're going to get a Highlander. They're going to need. Or yeah. They're going to get a Sequoia, Sequoia. Yeah. or you know, and then their kids going to you know buy yeah. buy a. And they knew their product was good too. That, that oh, yeah. that's a yeah. huge part of it, Absolutely. right? You couldn't. Yeah. You they knew they just needed people to experience. Yeah. Correct. Their and, product. And I mean, I, I I believe that that is the best example. And unfortunately, they, in order to do something like that, you have to play the long game. You got to be confident in it. You got to yeah. be confident in your product. You have to really commit to it. Right. And culturally over here, we don't have that don't mindset. Do it. Nope. It's getting worse and worse every yeah. year too. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's something that the results are needed now and how someone could quantify or track whether or not their investment into the sport of $5 million, um, paid off that's going to be a tough one in the near term yeah. mm -hmm. so right. you know you'd have to look more at a, a five-year plan or something right um you know or, or 10 years do you yeah. see wow. bass fishing that our demographics really support the companies that come in like say progressive is now where toyota used to be with bassmaster progressive has stepped in do you feel like us as anglers support those companies as much as we should um I know that, I mean, I have 
to immediate parallels uh, to this one I have progressive I'll tell you why in a minute um, but then another one is that Watts bar tournament we stayed at this best Western or something in uh, I believe it was Kingston Tennessee mm-hmm. and every time I drive out west like to the Sabine or something I try to stop there I try to stop at that one because I like that place and I think that that's the right thing to do. It was yeah, decent. Sure. And, and so I try to support yeah. the companies. You know, I'm right. not getting a break from them. I'm mm-hmm. not getting anything. But if I'm going to spend my dollars, I at least want to spend it with somebody who I hope it's still under the same ownership yep. yeah. that at one point in time supported such, yeah. such an event. Yeah. And yeah. Supports <laughs> your demographic. Yeah. And, you know, at least appreciates or is willing to take fishermen's dollars, which it startles me that some people are not. Yeah. Right. Um, <clears throat> but as far as progressive, <clears throat> as far as progressive goes, um, you know, they, I don't know their level of support. I don't see that they have jumped in whole hog like Toyota did. Right. But I will tell you that <clears throat> I looked at different policies and progressive has what I felt was probably the best policy for, <clears throat> excuse me. You're good. Can we take a break? Yeah, for yeah, a second? sure. Just get some water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Time uh, okay. So, purple. so back to progressive. Mm-hmm. Um, so I looked at different policies, and they actually have what I feel for a pretty big time tournament angler. They have the best policies that I can determine uh are out there um short of a commercial policy Mm -hmm. because when you start telling you you better make darn sure as a tournament angler who's Mm -hmm. fishing Mm -hmm. opens or you know the elite series or any of the bigger trails over there at uh, mlf or the bb uh, bass or npfl Mm -hmm. you better make darn sure that your insurance company knows what you're doing yeah and so when they ask you how fast does your boat go you better say 70. Yep. And then when you say, well, how many, you know, you also better tell them, look, I fish like, uh, you know, 70 tournament days a year. I fish 30 tournament days a year, whatever it is. Out of or state. 20 I travel. Out yep. of state. You yep. better tell them that because yep. a lot of insurance companies, they will not cover, cover that. It. Yep. And so your insurance agent will write it all day. Mm-hmm. But if something hits the fan and you end up putting your boat up in the woods, yep. you, you know, in a tournament, for an entry fee, yep. you know, you might be in for a rude awakening mm-hmm. if they choose to be difficult. Um, I know the Progressive, I've only ever had one claim with them. Um, I think you were part of that up at Cayuga. <laughs> yep. Um, all of, uh, a lot of our rods and stolen. equipment got stolen off our boats. Yep. Um, but uh, Progressive was good to deal with. Um, and I've heard other decent things, but I also had to get involved yeah. in a progressive claim for another fishing industry affiliated person. And they were fighting a tooth and nail. And eventually I got to the right person and the claim got paid. Wow. But, but it's, that's uh, any insurance company, right? Yeah. I mean, they're, they get claims not, all the time, not to be a jerk, but you know, their job is to take money in and not pay it out if they can figure out how not to. Right. And that's how they make money. It's business. Yeah. Um, so, which is why. You really need to be uh, aware, at least. You got to know what your policy is. Of what your policy yeah. is. And yeah. Because a lot of, I mean, if you tell them that you fish, you know, the, I don't know, all the opens, I mean, nine opens. If you tell them you fish all those and that you have these sponsors and you've got a wrap boat and truck, I mean, yeah. they, they might change, you know, yep. their tune real mm-hmm. quick. Mm-hmm. So, True. but progressive seems to be more along those lines. But their involvement, I don't know how big it is. It doesn't mm-hmm. feel as big as Toyota's. Right. Um, so I, I, I don't know. It's hard to, uh, you know, from a product standpoint, right? Like, I, like I, I seeing you guys in Tundras, big deal, right? You're driving them using the product, but uh, another um, insurance, like how do you activate that, right? So, it, yeah. you know, like even when you have fans there at the expo, like – tundra you can say hey open the door sit this in feature it. that feature yeah, the lights you can put them up and down you have mm-hmm. this you know yeah. you see them at you, the ramp right you see you don't see the insurance policy at the ramp no. you, but you yeah. see that tundra roll yeah. up it's a it's a weird it's a harder space. sell 
Yeah, I'm actually I'm actually in the middle of converting to progressive right now. To tell you the truth, and you know it's, it's RV, it's it's going to be two boats, it's going to be three trucks, it's going to be you know pretty much everything that involves you know the business of, mm-hmm. of bass fishing. And uh, my policy last year with another insurance company, I found this out too. I had to read through all the fine print. Was they only covered um you know any incidents that were one mile or less from the shoreline what happens when we go to lake ontario yeah. and we hit a shoal yep 1.5 miles away from the shoreline or even if you're just disabled out there and you have to call boat us I not mean, covered. I, I don't know if it's covered but not covered but, you know i mean you, my you, previous you, policy was not covered so you have to you got to pay attention to that there are certain things that you do and something like that is yeah. is one of them yeah. um but that's just some of the pitfalls that you deal with when yeah. you're trying to do something that for 99% of the people that do this, mm-hmm. it's a hobby. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's a very small percentage of people that have sponsors and fish tournaments and maybe make some money at it. Yeah. Those people enter a different realm and they at least need to be aware. Oops. I, I'm not just, I'm not just taking my boat out three times you know yeah. a month or something and fishing a tuesday night tournament somewhere mm, or no, something this no. is this is a different deal and if the crap hits the fan yep. your insurance company suddenly may change its tone yep three things you don't skimp on it's uh batteries rain gear insurance yeah like you got to be covered yeah you just yeah. at least have to know what you're dealing with yeah. and uh you know those those are <laughs> those are three good things yeah yeah so hey ed as we're wrapping up here we already kept you look at that clock right there we've already had you do almost almost two, two hours. hours i know you got a lot i'm sure this drive. is boring people to no death, no but, this is know, awesome so i think a lot of people really uh they appreciate the you know we always say behind the scenes look this is actually a deeper dive into the economics and how things work behind the scenes a lot of people don't even like they don't even think a lot of the anglers don't even think about some of the things you talked about today and and uh, we really appreciate you having on, having you on. Trey, I'm going to give you one more question. Well, you know, he's going to ask you the life advice question. I would like you to, for the anglers that are watching, right, who are dealing with companies, give them three things to be aware of or to make sure they have covered when dealing with a sponsor's contract. I would say that, you know, the renewal term is something that, you need to pay attention to um, because that, that again, as I outlined at the beginning of this is something that it, it can impact you. And you need to also realize that when you are trying to renegotiate or just get another deal signed, um, it isn't done until it's done. Mm-hmm. Right. And so if the renewal term, which in most contracts I see nowadays um, just says it ends December 31st, um and that's it there is no renewal when you're that's bad because you know i I would try to get it on a different cycle i don't know if anybody can make that happen but because if you're not talking to people in july and august then you know you're going to be you're if your company says we're not renewing it and it's december 31st you're not going to have anything for the yeah, following year. Right. And so many contracts come out right at the end of the year, even after yes. the beginning of the year. Yeah. And I'm, just, I'm relying time. on people. Trust me, it's Word. coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're, but but, we're always in but that. marketing managers move around, so you never mm-hmm. know when that person's just going to be gone. Yep. So the renewal term is something. Um, other, other aspects are, you know, the deliverables, like Chris mentioned. I mean, just be aware of what you're obligated to or obligating yourself to. Um, you know, sometimes there are... A certain number of appearances i'd just make sure that that is uh it's clearly understood what the parameters of that are because if you're required to do three appearances per year at the um entity's discretion make darn sure that you know whether they're paying for it you're paying for it yeah, you know most one, most yeah. of them should say you know uh that they'll they'll pay for it. Um, expenses you know yeah. um for the expenses so th- that's something important because I've seen one or two that it was just not written well. And they try to enforce it? No, they, they just, the angler would bring it to me. I'd say, well, it doesn't say that they're going to pay you for these. So right. if you're getting paid, you know, by, by a, a lure company, five grand or something for the year, 
and they say, hey, Be go, ICAST. go to ICAST, and you're living in Wisconsin. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. that that can be an expensive deal. Suddenly, your $5,000 you were getting is $3,000. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, or so they have a wrap I've seen where they want to be on the wrap, and they only pay this much, and your wrap costs that much. Yeah. And they're not footing any of the bill towards your wrap. So then what you think you have for this season to spend right. is now and, gone. And you know, you have to be careful about placement and size of logos. Yeah. Some have certain requirements of, you know, letters got to be four yeah. inches. They have to be in this particular part. There's if so you, much to it. If, if, <laughs> but, but, they, but I've seen anglers who have two contracts from different entities that say that they get this particular spot mm-hmm. yeah. or they get this particular size. They didn't size. even read that part. And of so they're, they're in conflict. They can't yeah. be in the same spot. And mm-hmm. so I say, well, just put it on there and see what happens. You, you put yourself in the spot. I can't fix it. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. They always, you know, people always come to me. Uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And people just always come to me for the cure. I'm like, why didn't you? you pre- yeah. Just, Any just preventative stop measures. it ahead of time. Yeah. 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 yeah, that's good advice. communication. Yeah. yeah. A long way. And, but, you know, it's th- those are some of the things that you probably need to look at with contracts. But there's no, there's no, nothing set in stone. I mean, it's. I do have one more question. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what are your opinion on like anglers who are using like agents within the industry and stuff? Do you have opinion there? Have you seen a lot of those contracts and I've seen one fishing agents. Yes, I've seen one and it didn't seem unreasonable. It was a high percentage that the agent was taking, Mm -hmm. but the agent had doors that they could open sure that the angler had no chance of getting in that mm-hmm. door no chance well minimal chance mm-hmm. and to to get to such a level so quickly mm-hmm. um so when i saw the percentage which i think was it might have been 30 percent um that they were taking but 30 percent of something is a lot better than a hundred percent of nothing. Yeah. Like if you never got that deal yeah. to begin with. And so, yeah. but much like those mu- music artists that I talked about who right. signed away their life at the beginning, yeah. and then those become people something. become dissatisfied very quickly once they start catching fire and right. their tournaments do real well and their social media explodes suddenly they think, well, that's not very fair. Yeah. You can't look at it. You have to look then, at it as a snapshot sure. of when you did it. Yeah. So are you, you have a, to live with it are until you a, it's over. Are you a fan of those multi-year deals for that? that situ- multi-year deals are... Um, because you could blow up during them, you know? I like multi-year deals. I don't have any. Um, but I like multi-year deals, and I know of some really big multi-year deals, mm-hmm. which that only makes sense to right. me. For both parties. For both parties. Right. But the one problem is, like with an agent deal, the one that I saw is that if you, let's say you get, uh, I don't know, Skeeter Boats or something. Mm-hmm. So you get Skeeter as a sponsor through this agent. Mm-hmm. And you get a great deal and it's working out great. And it's a two-year deal. In this particular contract, you had to keep paying that agent even after the contract expired for wow. a period of time. Wow. It wasn't in perpetuity. It wasn't forever, but it was for because they a negotiated year or two that deal Because they got for it up you. front. Wow. So, you know, that that's just something you got to live with. Or do you then, after you've exploded in tournaments or you've done well on social media, your guide service is killing it, or whatever it is, do you then say, well? I don't want to work with you anymore. I want to go over to this other brand boat because now I'm hot stuff and I'm just going to move and mm-hmm. it'll save me the 30% that I don't have to pay. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So tricky. you yeah. just have, you have to enter. I mean, everybody has a unique situation mm-hmm. and they have their own agenda and what their tolerances are for, um, for their given contracts. And so because of that, there isn't any one right answer. So you just have to tell people, and this is what I do, I tell people, these are the consequences of it. Right. You're going to be locked into this for two years. Even after that, you're going to have to keep paying Can 30%. You percent, it? And, and that's it. Now, look, if, if you stink and 
you stink to join up and no one cares about you, you're st- still they getting are, paid. They are supposed to still pay you. Yeah. Um, you know, and you just will have to do other things that are right. Yeah. Of value to there's them. risks on both sides. You could blow oh, yeah. up and, and think way. you should be getting more, but you've, you're in this, or you could stink it up and they're still having they're yeah. on the other and, side. Of and it. funny enough, I've uh, I don't hear from people when they stink it up, <laughs> <laughs> right? They, they don't argue about it then. Yeah. Yeah. So you know that's like when I go into court all the time. I do a lot of debt collection and I go in and you're seeking you know a I don't know a hospital bill for a thousand bucks. I've had literally in my career probably 120,000 cases, Mm -hmm. and I have never once heard someone say, they always say, I don't know that much. I've never heard any single person ever (laughs) say I owe more. And you would think if they're telling the truth that somewhere, somehow, someone would say, well, I think I owe more than that. But you just never hear that. So I I never hear from the people (laughs) who have stunk it up that, you know, or, or quit halfway through the season or something. Oh, I... I'm still getting those checks, but I quit. So, you know, should I give it back? I've never gotten that (laughs) call. (laughs) Right. So Uh, it's a two-way street. and Things need to be a two-way street. It's an investment on both sides. Partnership and investment on both sides. You write and write it out. Yeah. Well, speaking of riding out, I know you got to ride out of town here and get back to Richmond. Yep. And uh, I really appreciate you having uh, hopping on with us. I, there will be another time too. We could dig even deeper. I think this is probably one of the deepest conversations we had on the bilge. But before we let them go, uh, just life advice, something that you've stuck to maybe uh, your whole life, or maybe something you tell you know your kids. But just basic life advice, whether it it uh, it involves fishing or or business or just general life advice i said this off air and i'll to you guys and Mm -hmm. i'll probably uh catch some hell for it but stay away from heroin coffee and timeshares yep (laughs) and what i mean by that is obviously heroin there are certain bright lines you Mm -hmm. don't you don't you just don't do yep and whether it's drugs cheating on a spouse something ridiculous there are just hard lines that you absolutely do not cross so you don't do that coffee Sorry, sorry, (laughs) sorry, Black Rifle. (laughs) My wife drinks it. Um, But, you know, it's it's a habit, whether it's alcohol or coffee or whatever, that some people I know cannot function without it. Sure. I do not want to be a slave to anything like that. It becomes controlling at that point. It becomes controlling. And so you develop those habits that um, are just deleterious to your existence Mm -hmm. i think i mean it costs a bunch of money you gotta run around and get a cup at starbucks or mcdonald's or wherever you get you gotta do it your day yeah your day can't start unless you have it and everybody spills it in my truck it is not allowed in my truck (laughs) it's not allowed in my truck i had this uh, uh, funny story but i I won't tell it but you can't bring it in my truck because it's going to get spilled that's funny and so and then (laughs) timeshares they're just a bad investment (laughs) and you and what that means is you know timeshare is just an indication of you got to do the right things financially Mm -hmm. and you just got to take advice from people that know what they're talking about and it's not about hitting a home run mostly it's singles and doubles yeah just hit singles and doubles and no unforced errors progressing yeah and over time it, it financially things will work out and timeshares are just a bad investment yeah and so you you can't get suckered into the you can't get suckered into the hype you can't get suckered into buy this brand new truck right now Mm -hmm. or buy buy this brand new boat right now Mm -hmm. you have to go in with your eyes open or else you're going to end up behind the eight ball eventually unless just the planets align and they don't tend to do that for rare very case. many people. Rare case. So, no matter what it is, yeah. So that, that's what I would say. Heroin, coffee, and timeshare. Stay go. away from them and the things that they bring. <laughs> well, awesome, Ed. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. That was a great conversation. Trait, I'm not giving you any more questions. Save it for next time. There will be a part two with uh, with Ed Locker. And we appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Appreciate Maybe it. Maybe I'll be the bill rat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Oh, that was great.